Welcome to, uh, to our session. Um, Zoran and I uh, are data scientists at the, the machine um, cloud AI platform team. And as you know, yeah, this is what we are going to present today. So uh, maybe the first question from the title you would ask yourself, so what is entity extraction? Um, so here are the goals. I will introduce what or when you would like to perform an entity extraction task, um, how to train a custom entity extraction model, uh, what are word embeddings, how to train a custom word embedding model, how to train um, a DNN for your custom entity types. Um, entity extraction is a subtask of information extraction in general. You have unstructured text, um, right, uh, ar like articles, for instance, like uh, electronic medical records, and you'd like to extract pieces of information from the unstructured text. How to get structured information from unstructured text. It has different uh, names. Uh, they may call it named entity recognition, entity extraction, entity identification. All of them are interchangeable, referring to the same task. Um, like an example here, so we have this short sentence. It's free text, as we mentioned, unstructured. And the question is, what are the types of information that we can get from this sentence in an automatic way? As humans, yeah, it's clear. You can totally understand that uh, Zoran, Mohammed are person names, uh, San Francisco is country name, or so, sorry, city name, and so on if it is country or city or state or whatever. But for a machine, for a computer, how to understand this? So we need some things that would be able to highlight the information inside the text and would come back and say, okay, yes, Doran, Mohammed are probably person names, uh, Spark AI, maybe an org, San Francisco is a location. Um, what we have seen is very generic. You can find pre-trained systems, pre-trained models, to get this uh, public generic entity types, person, location, organization. But the challenge would be uh, when you would start to think about a specific domain, specific entity types. You are in a specific industry, you are in a specific domain, like in health domain, and you would have very specific entity types like uh, drug mentions, disease mention, genes, um, think about it in all the domains. Legal domain, they have their own terms that they would like to highlight, to extract. Um, whatever domain you think about, you will figure out that you would have your own specific entity types. And in that case, you have to go and build a custom system to serve this. Because the generic pre-trained systems will not be able to reach to this level of granularity. Um, yeah, I mentioned most of the things here. Then the question, uh, this is just to imagine. So here what we have is uh, the, the, the abstract of a medical uh, journal article from PubMed repo. And you can see, you can imagine uh, the amount of text that we have in the medical articles. And as you can see, they are unstructured. And the question is how to automate the process of extracting information from this. How can I easily have um, a software, a system that would analyze these millions? As we will see afterwards, we have more than 25 million articles in PubMed, only for the biomedical health domain, and you can correlate the same for other domains. Right? You have archives, millions of records, and we would like to automate the process of analyzing these records. Uh, now I'll switch to a short demo to show you what we would like to achieve. This is a very simple Azure website, Azure app, that we have developed in like uh, two or three days. Um, before building this demo website, we have trained uh, deep neural networks to solve different entity extraction tasks. As you can see here in the bottom, Actually, we had like three different data sets labeled to uh, 
to extract uh, different entity types, like we have one to discriminate uh, chemicals from drug mentions, uh, sorry, chemicals from disease mentions, another data set that actually would label uh, drug mentions, the third one for protein cells, getting DNA mentions, RNA mentions, and, and so on. Uh, we, we didn't, this is just for demo, because we didn't have a publicly available data set that would be labeled to cover the different entity types. So we ended up training three different models based on the data that we have. But in real world, in your scenario, in your case, probably you will have just single data set labeled based on your required entity types. Then after we trained the model using um, Azure Compute uh, uh, environments, using um, Spark cluster and Data Science VM, we have uh, operationalized the trained models. Uh, we created web services and hosted the trained models and started to call these web services from this website. So you can imagine here that I have an abstract, I have a medical article, I have a EMR, I have medical record. So I will start to type the text here and then I would start to get the results. So simply, as you can see here, we have these different entity uh, types, and the service will call the trained model and starts to highlight the different entity types, and it will return back to me um, the confidence score, like this mention, nitric oxide, uh, the model, the DNN in this case predicted it as chemical with confidence score 0.98, and for this word, it was predicted as a disease mentioned with score 97. Uh, the, the architecture is very generic, could be applied on different domains. The only difference would be the training data that you would use, that you would use to train the model. Okay, um, at a higher level, we will have two tasks, uh, two phases, two steps. The first one is to get uh, the features, feature engineering step, to get the required features to teach or to train this uh, system. And the second task, once we have the required features, is to build the domain-specific model, which is a deep LSTM neural network in that case. The advantage here is we will not spend much time in feature engineering. As you may know, this is the most challenging step in building a machine learning model. Uh, that may require a domain expert. You may need to have an expert in this domain to go and try to transfer the knowledge. If you'd like to get drug mentioned or disease mentioned, what would be the information required to get that? But here what we are doing is we are automating the feature engineering step. From data directly, we can go directly and get the required features and use these features to train the model. Uh, now I uh, will leave it to Zoran to uh, dig deeper and show you the different steps and the details of the different steps. Thanks, Mohammed. Yeah, so as Mohammed said, so we will now deep dive into the solution for the problem that, uh, of entity extraction. First step is to uh, train the word embedding model, which is going to be our feature extractor. So, word, so what are word embeddings? Let's first see the highlight of our architecture. First, we take a large number of biomedical articles from PubMed. As you can see, it's, it's over 20 million articles. We take abstracts that are publicly available and download them onto Spark uh, cluster, uh, Azure HD Insight cluster. And after some pre-processing and converting them into a suitable form, which is the TSV format, uh, we train the word embedding model using uh, Spark MLlib uh, word to vec uh, algorithm. So the key here is that for, to train word embeddings, you don't need label data. So you can take as much data as, as you can, as you can find. From, uh, and what we want to show here is that it is useful to train a, a domain-specific word embedding model. So there, there are uh, generic models, but here in the biomedical application, we want to, sh to see how well the, the, the model that is trained on biomedical articles would perform. So let me first, uh, f uh, word embeddings are now uh, very uh, 
very much used in uh, sorry uh, in deep neural network models. Uh, but just to give a quick intro, so if this is your uh, deep neural network and you want to, uh, your input is just text, just pure text. So you want to convert this text into some features, and there are different types of features that uh, that are typical in uh, natural language processing tasks. But word embeddings are uh, such features that convert uh, words into semantic continuous vector representation of words. What, that, what does that mean? So each word is represented with a vector, a continuous valued uh, vector of small dimension, let's say uh, 100. And the meaning of this uh, representation is that if two words are semantically similar to each other, they're supposed to be uh, close to each other in this embedding space. So if this is this 100 dimensional embedding space, and now, if I, if I take a look at one particular word, let's say brain, and want to find what are the closest words to this word uh, in this vector representation, let's say by, by just a, a simple distance metric, it will be, as you can see, these words are all related to word brain. And that is something that algorithm finds by itself. Um, and well, there's no, we don't have time to go into all the details of how, how the algorithms work, but in, a, in, in a one sentence, these algorithms uh, try to assign similar vectors to words that ap appear in similar contexts. So basically, uh, the training data for each word is the context that surrounds this word. And that is why it is unsupervised algorithm, because you don't need to label it. You just need sentences, because in sentences, you just need text, because in text, you find context for each word. And then the algorithm, the algorithm tries to find, uh, tries to assign uh, uh, vectors to words such that those that appear in similar contexts have similar, similar vectors. And that's why uh, it's not just syntactic similarity, it's semantic similarity. So as I mentioned, there are publicly available uh, pre-trained models, and the, the famous one is the one trained on Google News data. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's trained on, on a huge amount of data. Uh, but the question is, what if I have a domain-specific problem? And uh, do, uh, so we asked this question, uh, can we do better if we, if we train a, a domain-specific word embedding model? So we, uh, we did this that I mentioned in the architecture slide. So we downloaded the uh, PubMed data, uh, which is 27 million uh, abstracts and, and has uh, 22 gigabytes worth of uh, size of data. And we used a Azure HD Insight Spark cluster with 11 worker nodes. Uh, and as I mentioned, the MLlib uh, algorithm from uh, so the word to back uh, algorithm from MLlib library. And the training on the Spark cluster, it took about half, uh, half an hour. So, and we could see that it improves a lot, but uh, so with, with fewer worker nodes, it was maybe two or three hours, and then with, uh, with more nodes, it was, uh, it was pretty fast. So now that we trained uh, word embedding model. Uh, the next step is to use these word embeddings as features to train an entity extraction uh, model. So here, what we do is, now that we save these word embeddings, um, we first take, so just to take a step back, for entity extraction, we do need label data. Uh, so uh, at least no one saw this in an unsurprised way yet. So we do need label data to, to have some examples. What is person, what is organization, what is a drug, what is a disease? So whatever are the, the, ent the types of entities that we are interested in uh, for sp in a specific application. So uh, we also, uh, there are also publicly available uh, uh, data sets for entity extraction that Mohammed showed you in the demo. 
uh, those three data sets, one with uh, drugs, one with chemical and diseases, and, and the third one with, with uh, uh, proteins, DNAs, RNAs, and et cetera. So we split this, we, we don't, so let's say we take one of these data sets. So we train each, each of these three uh, models separately. So let's say you, you take one of these data sets, you download it, and you split it into training and test data. So this is shown here uh, in our storage, with, where we split this, uh, this data set into training and test. So in the first step, we take the training data, and um, we first do some simple processing, uh, such as splitting it, uh, 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 such as tokenization and sentence splitting. And then we pass it through the word embedding model. So what the word embedding model does, it converts our, uh, the input text into the word embeddings, and we use this as features for, for entity extraction. And then the labels are provided by the data set. Uh, so now that we have features and labels, we uh, train the uh, DNN model on the Azure uh, Data Science Virtual Machine with uh, GPU capabilities. So here, here it is also important that uh, it is much faster to train it with, uh, on a GPU-enabled machine. Um, and uh, again, we can train this model in less than uh, half an hour. And now we have our, our DNN model. So here you can see LSTM because this is the, the, type, of, uh, the uh, type of architecture that we use, and I will talk a little bit about that. Um, but for now, it's just a DNN model that is capable of, uh, of, of uh, doing entity extraction. And of course, we can uh, evaluate this model using the test data, uh, check the performance, and once we are happy with the performance, we can deploy the model and it is ready for consumption. So the first uh, question is, well, this is, a, <laughs> this is a deep learning session, right? So uh, we know deep learning is, uh, we hear deep learning is good, and, uh, but uh, wh why is it the case? Wh why do we get a, a good results with deep learning uh, over the traditional methods uh, here on the entity extraction task? So, um, the, the, so deep, learning, uh, deep learning networks are, First of all, they're very complex. So the, the processing units in, in DNN models are nonlinear units, uh, as opposed to uh, here, I'm trying to compare DNN to the CRF, or the conditional random field model, which is a traditional approach for entity extraction. So for, for a long time, it, 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 has, it has been a state of the art for entity extraction. However, uh, with, with advances in deep learning, now we can achieve better results. So one reason is that CRF is a linear model so it can, dis uh, so, and, uh, and DNN models are, are nonlinear, and they, they can describe more complex, uh, f uh, they basically describe more complex models, more complex functions from input to output. Also, in DNS, you can have multiple layers. You, can, you basically have some hidden structure, where in CRF, it's just one layer. So, what, uh, given the, the, uh, the, the higher complexity of DNN, they are capable of learning more. Of course, it's, all, it's, it's just a question of how you achieve that, but the recent ad advances um, in, uh, 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 there were developed uh, um, specific architectures that are very good for, for sequence labeling tasks, such as entity extraction. So the RN, RNN, or recurrent neural networks, uh, or even uh, more, speci more, more uh, specific flavor of RNNs, which are LSTMs, uh, they're very good at doing, doing ty these types of tasks. And because of uh, this uh, uh, progress and this particular uh, development in, this, in architectures, we are able to, 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 to actually force the DNN to learn a, good, a very good uh, uh, sequence labeling model and, and to get a good result. So what we do uh, in our application, well, we use Keras with TensorFlow um, on a GPU-enabled uh, enabled uh, Azure Data Science Virtual Machine. Um, and um, this is the architecture. It has um, basically two LSTM la layers. It has an embedding layer, which uh, transforms the input to the embedding, to the word embeddings. And it, ha it has two LSTM layers, which improves the performance as opposed to just having one LSTM layer. And each layer, each LSTM layer is followed by a dropout layer, which, um, 
simply uh, is it's um, um, it prunes the model so that it doesn't overfit the data. So let me uh, move to the results. So these are the three data sets. So you can see where, where we found them and downloaded them. And I won't, uh, I, we already uh, described them twice, so I will just skip to the next slide. So this is just to give you an idea of the size of the data set. This is one, one of these three data sets, is uh, a biocreative uh, five uh, corpus, which has chemicals and diseases labeled. It has um, uh, around 200,000 uh, words. So in the, tra uh, or let me say it has more than 300,000 words overall. And uh, more than 12, uh, more than 10,000 uh, entities labeled uh, from of, of disease type, and uh, about 15,000 uh, chemicals labeled, and we split this. Uh, t we take two thirds as a training data and one third as a as a test data. We use uh, to to train this model. Uh, we use our uh, our own package, which is the Azure ML. Uh, package for text analytics, uh, which is now in, in public preview, uh, and you can check it out. Uh, but basically, of, co of course, you can achieve uh, all this with your own tools. Uh, here, what, what we try uh, to achieve is to help ourselves as data scientists as well as developers to, um, to just make it easier to put these uh, pipelines together, or uh, we also provide out of the box pipeline. So for example, for, for, for what, uh, for, to get, to train these models that, that, that we are talking about today, we have a pre, we have a pre configured pipelines that, that, uh, do all the pre processing and, um, so it starts from pre processing, futurization, and also includes the, the a trainer. Um, so you don't need to, to deal with all the, the messy stuff. As, and uh, in terms of the uh, other algorithms we will compare against is the conditional random fields. And typically, conditional random fields uh, have been used with um, tra traditional types of features, uh, such as, well, you can include the word itself, which is just the word uh, ID or like or one hot encoding. Um, or there are orthographic features, which is a capitalization type of features. Uh, type of token, is it a word, is it a number, and so on. And part of speech tagging, which is another typical features. Um, so these features are, um, uh, these features are good, are useful, but uh, word embeddings, uh, the, 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 the advantage of word embeddings is that you don't need to, to think about feature engineering. You can just, uh, you can just train a model and then that's your, your, your word embedding model. So here are some results. So first, uh, if you look at dictionary lookup, it's just simply trying to find uh, phrases that are in the training data and just basically collect the phrases that are in the training data and see if they, are, they, if they appear in the test data. So this simple approach achieves the F score of 68%. And CRF with traditional features that uh, I just showed you in the previous slide achieves 70%. For some, re for some reason, CRF doesn't work very well with the, with the embedding uh, model. So it's only 48% F score. It does, however, and my, uh, my assumption is that it is because of the type of the model it is, because of because how it is like a, uh, a simple linear model and cannot take advantage of the uh, um, of, of the of the nature of the word embeddings. Um, however, it's still it's still useful to add embeddings to the traditional features. So if you have CRF model with traditional and embeddings, uh, it it does a little bit better. So it's seventy one percent as opposed to seventy. But if you use the the uh, uh, the LSTM uh, network, the D DNN architecture that's good for sequence uh, labeling, only with, with word embedding features. It achieves 76% uh, 
So basically, without additional features. And we actually tried, uh, we, we also tried with adding other features to the, uh, to the DNN model, it, and it improves by one more percent. However, uh, to me, the conclusion is that you can use a, s a simple, approach, a simple uh, set of features without doing a lot of uh, engineering. So just use word embeddings and this DNN approach um, and achieve a very good result. And the last one uh, is the same LSTM uh, model, but using the generic uh, word embeddings trained uh, using Google dataset. So you can see that the, the medical, uh, the, 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 the domain-specific uh, word embedding outperform the generic word embedding. So the, the message is that it is useful to train a domain-specific word embedding model if you have a domain-specific application. And just to show that this is not just on a one uh, data set, so here is a comparison between a uh, result with PubMed, uh, uh, trained embeddings versus Google uh, uh, news embeddings on multiple data sets. And you can see that on all these data sets, if you just look at the tables below, the Medline is the, the domain-specific embedding uh, pipeline. You can see that it outperforms the, the generic pipeline. And here, so here we try on, on all these data sets that we, that we have. So just to conclude, as we are out of time, so what we showed you is a recipe for building a custom entity extraction pipeline. And this recipe is that you get a large uh, un annotated or unlabeled data uh, corpus and train a word embedding uh, model, and then uh, use a, a, a labeled data set for entity extraction and train an LSTM-based uh, neural network and use a GPU, uh, GPU-enabled virtual machine. <laughs> and uh, also, we showed that word embeddings are powerful features, so they compare well against additional features. Um, and uh, also, it is useful to train uh, when you use the domain-specific uh, word embeddings. They, they can outperform the generic word embeddings. So you can, and uh, just one last word, you can also find more information at our booth. All right, thank, thank you. you.